What's going down, history people? Today we're taking a look at post-World War II America, the Truman Administration, and the Cold War. This is going to be a long lecture, so let's get started. Post-war economy, there was a concern that the economy would collapse after World War II. Would there be enough jobs for the GIs returning from Europe and the war in the Pacific, the 15 million soldiers? Could the Great Depression return? And one of the things that was done in 1944, you have the GI Bill of Rights, also known as the Servicemen's Readjustment Act. Is it helped veterans by providing tuition assistance for school and low interest government loans to buy homes, start businesses, and other things? Although there was this fear that possibly the economy could fall apart, it's important to note there's an economic boom that occurs roughly from the late 1940s, 1950 onward. In fact, you're going to have a huge economic boom. And one of the reasons is, remember, during World War II, there was no consumer goods. So people were saving money. And as the war ends, they are now having huge purchasing power available. After World War II, the United States is by far the richest nation in the world. And the middle class, especially in the 1950s, is going to grow to over 50%. Stimulating out a lot of this growth is defense spending as the Cold War gets heated. It's a big reason for the economic prosperity. Not only that, but worker productivity increases, there's an increase in people going to school, and much of this growth is going to occur in the Sun Belt. It's warmer, there's lower taxes, and a lot of the defense work, the defense jobs are going to take place in this Sun Belt. And then finally, in the next video, we're going to talk about the movement in the suburbs, Levittown, and the baby boom. Now, the president in 1945, when the war ends, is Harry Truman, and he, remember, was vice president, Roosevelt dies, and he's going to have a tough time politically. A um, couple of things about Harry Truman. Truman is a moderate Democrat from Missouri, and he's going to do some things that's going to anger those both in the Republican and Democratic Party. And really, the big one is this. He is the first president in the 20th century to use the powers of the presidency to challenge racial discrimination. He is going to issue the Committee on Civil Rights, where the civil rights issues are investigated and most famously he is going to issue the executive order which desegregates the armed forces this is going to anger southern democrats and they're going to try to block other efforts that truman tries to do in the realm of civil rights another challenge truman faced is republicans who controlled congress during this time passes the taft hartley act over his veto and this act really was a setback for labor unions it made closed shops illegal closed shops if you recall to hire only union employees this makes that illegal and really since the wagner act during the second new deal labor unions have been doing really well the taft hartley act really is a setback. A big reason why it's passed is Republicans wanted to reduce the growing power of unions. Going into the election of 1948, the Democrats were divided. Really, it was the issue of civil rights, but also there were those in the party who thought Truman was not liberal enough. In fact, liberal Democrats supported Henry Wallace for the presidency. Southern Democrats had actually split and supported Strom Thurmond with the so-called Southern Democrat Dixiecrat Party, and the Republican Party had their own candidate. In fact, most analysts picked Truman to lose to the Republican candidate, and in 1948, Truman, you could see him there with the newspaper predicting his defeat. Truman does win re-election. And with Truman's re-election, he attempts to adopt his domestic reform program that was known as the Fair Deal. And there's a whole bunch of things that he wants to do. He wants to extend the programs and the progress of the New Deal. So for example, extending social security benefits, increasing the minimum wage, national health insurance, and other issues like civil rights, education funding, and so on. Unfortunately for Truman, not only do Southern Democrats block his proposals, but also Republicans in Congress, and a lot of what he is going to try to do is not going to be accomplished. The one exception was an increase in the minimum wage. It goes from 40 cents to 75 cents an hour. But it's really domestic disputes, but really also foreign policy becomes a huge priority for Truman. So let's take a look at that. Like in the post-World War I period, the U.S. will play a key role in post-World War II affairs. In fact, following World War II, the U.S. is no longer isolationist. One example of that is the U.S. joins the new international organization, the United Nations, in 1945. It was created during the war. Remember, after World War I, we reject the League of Nations. Not this time. In fact, America will be one of the permanent 
UN Security Council member nations. Another area where America plays a key role is in international finance agreements, which were established at the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944, and they sought to establish a stable global economy. Two things created at this conference was the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and the World Bank, and both of these were intended to help rebuild war-torn world that existed after World War II and to help promote international trade. And the Soviets, though, are going to reject these institutions because they viewed them as a tool to promote capitalism and they will not join either. The big thing, though, under Truman's administration after World War II is the beginning of the Cold War. And the Cold War will be an ideological, political, and in some instances, military struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union. It's going to last from roughly 1945 until 1991 until the collapse of the Soviet Union. So let's take a look at some of the factors that cause this. One thing to keep in mind is that Big Three alliance between England, the United States, and the Soviet Union was a temporary halt to hostility which had existed even before World War II ends. In fact, even prior to 1945, tensions existed between the two sides, the U.S. and the Soviets. For example, there was an ideological conflict between capitalism and communism. Remember, we were afraid after World War I, we had a red scare with their fear of a communist revolution. In fact, Wilson supported the White Army, which sought to stop the Bolshevik Revolution. Wilson fails at achieving that goal. In fact, the United States does not recognize the Soviet Union until 1933. Stalin was a brutal dictator, which made a lot of Americans not like him very much. And he also signed a non-aggression pact with Hitler in 1939, which for many people proved that this man could not be trusted. There also was tensions during World War II. Remember, this was an alliance that was very much an alliance of convenience or necessity. They needed each other to beat the Axis powers. Some examples of tensions, remember Stalin was angry over the delays of opening the Second Front. It would not be opened until 1944. Soviets were not included in the development of the atomic bomb during the Manhattan Project. And the U.S. and the Soviets had a very different vision for the fate of Eastern Europe. One important thing to keep in mind is what happens at the Yalta Conference during the war and what it means for post-war Europe. The Big Three meet in Yalta in early 1945. Roosevelt is alive at that point, and they discuss a couple of things. One is the post-war plan, specifically in Eastern Europe. Both Roosevelt and Churchill think at Yalta that Stalin agrees to allow representative government for elections to take place, but you can see in that political cartoon, Stalin has no interest in doing that. The other thing is, Roosevelt is really desperate to get Stalin to agree to help out in the war against Japan. There was a fear that the Allies would have to invade Japan to defeat them. There was no atomic bomb ready yet, and the casualties on smaller islands such as Iwo Jima and Guadalcanal made Roosevelt very intent on getting Stalin to join the war. When the war ends, Soviet troops are occupying most of Eastern Europe, and Stalin decides that he wants to create a buffer zone in that region. For Stalin, the Soviet Union had suffered nearly half the deaths of World War II, about 20 million casualties, and for him, he refuses to remove the Red Army from Eastern Europe, and rigged elections brought pro-Soviet governments into power. And for the Soviet Union, these pro-Soviet puppet governments were in the name of preserving Soviet security. For the United States and England, this was an attempt to spread communism, and they wanted to protect and promote self-determination, democracy, and free trade in this region, and tensions were increasing. One of the important things that you keep in mind is what happens in Europe, and in particular, the policy of containment. In March of 1946, the former Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, gives the Iron Curtain speech in Fulton, Missouri, and he basically says that an Iron Curtain has descended across the continent. He's looking at that area in the red and said that these countries are under Soviet control. And he wanted, Churchill wanted, Western democratic nations, the United States and England especially, to join together to stop Soviet expansion. One month prior, a guy by the name of George Kennan develops the containment policy in his long telegram, a secret document, in February of 1946. In this, the United States is encouraged to stop Soviet expansion. In fact, he calls on the U.S. to adopt a policy known as containment, and that the U.S. needs to stand up to Soviet expansion, and that they would back down. The containment policy becomes the... U.S. foreign policy through much of the Cold War, and it's super important you understand it. 
So what did containment look like? Well, following World War II, both Greece and Turkey were under communist pressure. In Greece, there was a communist uprising, and the Soviet Union was putting external pressure on Turkey for strategic reasons. And so what ends up happening is Truman issues something called the Truman Doctrine in March of 1947. In this, he said the United States would provide military and economic aid to help what he called the free people of Greece and Turkey from falling to the communists. The United States would give $400 million, Congress authorizes this, in order to contain the spread of communism. What Greece and Turkey are not going to get are U.S. troops, but they are going to get that $400 million in aid. And both countries will not fall to communist rule. Another problem for Truman to deal with is as a result of the economic hardships facing Europe in 1946-1947, there was a fear that communists may, may be voted into power in Western Europe, especially places like France and Italy, which were devastated by World War II. In response, the United States issues the European Recovery Program by Secretary of State George Marshall, more commonly known as the Marshall Plan. Under this plan, the U.S. would provide billions of dollars of aid to Europe. The idea behind it is we would be able to stop communism, to contain communism, by providing economic aid. These countries would rebuild and prosper, and people would not be willing to vote for the communists. Western Europe rapidly rebuilds and communism does not spread as a result of the Marshall Plan. It is a huge success and you can look at the large amounts of money given to different countries. The Soviets were offered aid along with their eastern satellite countries, but the Soviet Union rejects that aid. The next crisis of the Cold War occurs in Germany. Following World War II, Germany was divided and controlled by the U.S., England, France, and the Soviet Union, and that it also included the capital, Berlin. It was also divided amongst these four countries. Stalin wanted a weakened Germany following World War II and wanted them to pay reparations, and he's really once again concerned about security, also spreading communism, and he's afraid of a reunited Germany posing a threat to the Soviet Union. He begins to form the German Democratic State, which would be a communist puppet government. And the big moment happens in June of 1948. Stalin decides he's going to blockade Berlin. Truman doesn't want to look weak or back down in this situation. He remembers the failures of appeasement at Munich, but he also knows he does not want a wider war. He does not want to start World War III. This is a major international crisis. Truman doesn't want to give up on the people of Berlin, so he makes the move to order the Berlin airlift. This provides the city of Berlin with supplies for nearly a year, 11 months. This was a tense international situation. Truman mobilizes bombers capable of carrying atomic bombs to England. The world is very close to a potential World War III, but luckily after 11 tense months, Stalin ends the blockade in May of 1949. Although this crisis ends, throughout the Cold War, Germany is going to remain divided between the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany, and the German Democratic Republic, East German, run by the Soviet Union. During the Cold War, you're going to have a huge military buildup. In fact, in 1949, the U.S. joins its first peaceful defensive military alliance, NATO. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization was an organization of all those countries you see in green. It will continue to grow throughout the Cold War and basically what it said is an attack on one nation is an attack on all. The Soviet Union later on will form its own military organization known as the Warsaw Pact in the red and in 1947 the United States will pass National Security Act which established the Department of Defense, the National Security Council, NSC, and the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. And all of these organizations were intended to help the U.S. foreign policy. Throughout the Cold War, there's going to be an arms race between the U.S. and the Soviet Union as both nations try to compete militarily. In fact, the United States in 1949 will lose its monopoly on the atomic bomb when the Soviet Union detonates its first atomic bomb. In 1950, there's a report, a secret report called NSC-68, which called for a massive military buildup. It called on the U.S. to rapidly increase defense spending to make it up to 20% of the gross national product. And it called on these things so that the U.S. would be able to deter Soviet aggression. 
and those recommendations will be implemented with the Korean War, which we'll discuss in just a moment. And finally, in 1952, the U.S. will test the first hydrogen bomb, which was way more powerful than the bombs dropped during World War II. The Cold War is not just going to be something that happens in Europe, it's also going to take place in Asia. In China, there was a civil war going on between the nationalists under the leadership of Chiang Kai-shek versus the Chinese communists led by Mao. In fact, that civil war had been going on since the 1930s. It stops when Japan attacks China during World War II. Remember, the United States had given aid to China under Lend-Lease as part of the Allies. When the war ends, the Civil War re-emerges. The United States provides lots of financial support to the nationalist forces under Chiang Kai-shek, but the bad economy, his very corrupt government, led to a decline in Kai-shek's popularity. And as a result of this, you're going to have two Chinas, because in 1949, Mao declares China to be a communist country. The People's Republic of China will be formed. The United States will not formally recognize communist China until 1979. And it won't be until Richard Nixon in the early 70s that this relationship will begin to change. Chiang Kai-shek and his people flee to Taiwan or Formosa, and he claims to be the true ruler of China. But in the end, China falls to the communists. This is bad for Truman politically because Republicans blame him for losing China, the loss of China, in spite of the fact that this was an internal issue between Chinese and their own political struggles, but the U.S. signed up with the wrong side and ultimately Truman's policies failed to contain the spread of communism. Keep in mind this happens in 1949, which is the same year that the Soviets got the bomb. And so you have a growing fear in the United States about this spread of communism. In fact, in the late 1940s, you have a second Red Scare occur. There is a widespread fear of communist influence and infiltration in American life. Various laws were passed even before the Cold War began, such as the Smith Act, which made it illegal to belong to an organization that advocated the overthrow of the government by force. The Federal Employee Loyalty Program was passed in 1947, which investigated the background of federal employees. The House of Un-American Activities Committee is restarted after World War II to search for communist influence in American life. Many different people were called before this committee, such as Hollywood actors, government officials, and they were called before the committee to testify as to whether or not they have ever associated with any known communists. People were blacklisted, and it created a huge chilling effect in American society. This wasn't all paranoia. There were some examples of spies among us. In fact, the most famous case is that of Alger Hiss. Alger Hiss was a State Department member who was accused of being a communist by an individual by the name of Whitaker Chambers in 1948. Hiss was a guy who worked with the government. He was at Yalta with Franklin Roosevelt. He denies the charges, but during the HUAC investigation, Congressman Richard Nixon makes a name for himself during the investigation and Hiss is convicted of perjury of lying under oath and he is sent to jail. This raised further questions, are there other communists within the government? And in 1951, a couple by the name of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were convicted of espionage and executed in 1953. And of course, the big figure during this time is going to be Joseph McCarthy, which we'll talk about in the next video. And finally, the Korean War. Korea, remember, was occupied by Japan during World War II, and following the war, it is divided at the 38th parallel. North of the 38th parallel, the Soviet Union would occupy, and south of the 38th parallel, the U.S. would occupy. This occupation was supposed to be temporary, and by 1949, both countries, both the U.S. and the Soviets, withdrew their troops. However, in June of 1950, North Korea shocks the world when it invades, communist North Korea invades South Korea. In order to contain the spread of communism, the U.S. under the United Nations comes to the defense of South Korea. Truman never gets a declaration of war from Congress. No war is declared. It's called a police action. And even though it's under the U.N., the U.S. was the bulk of the troops in this effort to contain communism. The war goes back and forth. You could see in this map right here, the invasion takes place. Very quickly, the communist North Koreans occupy most of South Korea, but luckily, Douglas MacArthur lands at Incheon and pushes the communists back across the border. However, not listening to warnings by China, China 
sends in huge amounts of troops across the Yalu River and pushes the U.S. and the United Nations troops all the way back down. Once the Chinese and North Korean troops pushed the UN troops back across the 38th parallel, MacArthur called for expanding the war and he criticized the limited war strategy of President Truman. He actually wanted to, in his quote you can see, there is no substitute for victory. He wanted to defeat the communist in North Korea, possibly by bombing China or in it, even invading China. He wanted to widen the war. Truman wants to avoid a bigger conflict. He wanted a limited war where the war was only about containing communism. MacArthur kept questioning the president publicly and eventually the popular general is fired. And it was very controversial for Truman because of the popularity of MacArthur, but he preserves the balance of power where the president is the commander in chief. Eventually, after a lot of fighting in 1953, an armistice will be reached and Korea will be divided even to this day at the 38th parallel. But the outcome containment worked. Truman and Eisenhower later on are able to keep South Korea from falling to the communist. However, some critics charged Truman of being soft on communism for not widening the war, but most historians agree it was the smart move. And as I mentioned earlier, U.S. defense spending under NSC 68 dramatically increases as a result of the Korean War. That's going to do it. This was a super long lecture, a lot of important stuff in here. If you have any questions, make sure you post them in the comment. If you haven't done so, subscribe and tell all your classmates to do the same. And if the video helped you out, click like. Remember, nobody puts a push in the corner. Peace.